All right, Revelation chapter 20. Uh, let's pick up here, verse 1. Let's read down through verse 6 to begin with. Revelation 21 through 6. Then I saw the angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay. So we read about the binding of Satan, the reign of Christ, and the martyrs who are with him there. Uh, I'm actually going to pick up with question number two. Let's just cover that before we jump into the rest of this. But question number two, I'd ask, what do premillennialists say about particularly verses four through six, and why is it false? Because here in Revelation 20 is one of the major places that people who believe in the premillennial doctrine they will they'll point and say well well here's what's going to happen here's what we see in the future um maybe we should back up just a second high level overview what is premillennialism we are living previous to the millennial, the thousand year reign of Christ. And um, there's going to be this rapture that happens and then we have this turmoil that, that happens for three and a half years and then after that Christ returns again. You know, there's many different ways that they have, but um, you're talking about premillennialism. The reason it's called premillennial is because they believe that we are living previous to this thousand year reign of Christ. Okay, yeah. There's the premillennialism that says the there is a thousand year reign of Christ on earth that is in our future. There are people who believe in postmillennialism that say that there's going to be uh, the return of Christ after a thousand year reign and in a rapture after a thousand years, I think that's how it is. But then there is the amillennial position, which is what we take. <laughs> well, we, we don't believe in either, either of those doctrines. Um, but yeah, so what do premillennialists use in here to do their teaching and, and what's wrong with it? What's the problem here? What's mainly wrong is I've had some points from the book. Um, First, the second coming of Christ is not in that passage. There is no bodily resurrection in that passage. There is no reign of Christ on earth in that passage. There is no literal throne of David in that passage. There is no Jerusalem or Palestine in that passage. No conversion of the Jews in that passage. And the church on earth is not. Okay. All right. To recap, kind of what. Rick just ran through. Premillennialism says there's going to be a, a, a rapture. There's, and this is what's funny. They, they believe actually in the second and the third coming of Christ. They believe the second coming is when the rapture occurs. There will be seven years of tribulation. And then there's going to be this, the return of Christ to earth, the battle of Armageddon, the defeat of the Lord's enemies, a thousand years 
of Christ reigning on the earth where everybody on earth is loyal to him, subject to him. It's going to be a glorious, you know, golden age of Christ and his reign. Um, and then at the end of that, there will be this judgment. Uh, you know, people go to heaven or to hell. And, and in a part of that, the beginning of the millennium, what they say is that all Jews are going to be converted and transported to Palestine. That they will fulfill or they will dwell in the territory that God promised originally to Abraham. They say all of that's unfulfilled, but be that as it may, they pack all these things into a passage where none of those things are mentioned. As Rick said, second coming's not mentioned here. A bodily resurrection isn't mentioned. Um, reign of Christ on earth on the literal throne of David which is key to premillennialism they, they believe the actual so you know we we've, we've got a little mini pew up here they believe the actual literal physical chair throne that David sat on is going to be there in Jerusalem and Jesus is going to sit on it and reign from that throne um, so that's not in here. Conversion of Jews, transportation of the Jews, the uh, you know, literal Palestine or um, Israel is not mentioned. Uh, the kingdom or the church of God on earth isn't in here. None of that's here. But yet they construct an entire doctrine around this brief mention of a thousand year reign. Well, it's, it's important to know that's why it's important that we don't go into the scriptures with a preconceived idea of what we wanted to say. Because from that, they expound into Daniel, they expand into Ezekiel, some of the, the major prophets of the Old Testament. They start to kind of combine all that together to start to kind of fit that in what you just read here in Revelation. So if it's not found here, I find it over here, and I'll find it over here, and I'll find it over here. So, it's that preconceived idea that I know what it says, and instead of just allowing it to say what it says, trying to pull other resources into it makes it fit. Right, and, and that's, that's a huge danger with anyone going to the Word of God that if, you, if you're not careful, you will end up connecting unrelated passages to try to fit in what it is that you, you want to fit in there. Um, also, taking a section of symbolic language, sign symbols, figurative language, and making it literal. That's always a mistake. Paul, do you have something? So, we see here that it talks about this thousand years but it's not talking about a literal thousand years any more than it's talking about anything happening here on earth. And we'll dig more into that in a little bit. But this section here is really simply about the defeat of Satan, the triumph of Christ, but really more focused on the triumph of those who are followers of Christ. Those who have given their lives for Christ. The first defeat of Satan that we read about in this book, remember, was back in chapter 12 where he was cast from heaven down to earth and then he went about on the earth trying to destroy you know, the offspring of the woman or talking about the church, talking about those who were part of that church, going after them. And so he was cast out of heaven there. Here's the second defeat that we see that he is bound... He is limited in his power. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But we know it's not the final defeat. Why? When he's bound here, how do we know it's not the final defeat? Because it says he'll be loose. Okay, he'll be loosed. And then we have also later on the final uh, resurrection and judgment stated in this chapter as well. Exactly. Right here in this chapter it goes on to talk about when he's cast into the lake of fire, which we'll again hopefully get to in just a little bit. But, so you, you've got first of all, it says in verse 1, an angel coming down from heaven 
And this angel has a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, first of all, um, before we read in chapter 9 where there was an angel with a key to the bottomless pit, but the chapter went on to explain that Satan was the one who had that key. Okay, here, this is a different vision and it's, giving, it's saying that this key is in the hand of a different angel. So we don't, that's another one of those cases where we don't want to blend them up and get them mixed up in here and say, well, wait, this, this here contradicts that over there. Well, there are two different visions that are being given to us. In chapter 9, it talked about Satan having this key to the bottomless pit, and he opened it up, and all this black smoke pours forth. It's, it's the idea that he had the ability to, to bring sin and error out and push it on to the people of the earth. It's just saying he had that power to do it because of that key. Well, here is an angel with a key to the bottomless pit. Again, authority or power to do something that is given to him by God. And it says he has in his hand a great chain. And he goes and he lays hold of the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Now, when you read about that, you read a bottomless pit, you read about an angel, you read about a chain, you read about the devil. Do you take that all literally? Is there a literal chain that you can take and wrap up the devil with and bind him. He's not a physical being. Right? Is there even is it even possible to have a bottomless pit? Okay, it wouldn't be a pit, it'd be a tube, right? <laughs> it'd be a tunnel, I guess. But yeah, there's it's it's giving us, again, to emphasize symbolic language to just give us a concept of what's happening here. Somehow he's going to be bound. It's putting it in terms that we have some familiarity with, I guess, with the chain, the great chain. But just the idea of this power and this restraint that is placed upon the devil. So he's going to be limited in his ability to work here. He, he's not as free as he was before. He's not unfettered. Now he's fettered in his work. Um, why would this be talking about him being chained now, considering what we previously read, especially in chapter 19? What, what changed? What altered in 19? Do you remember? In verse 20, it, it talks about the beast was captured and with him the false prophets who were signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. So there was a constraint that has been put upon them. Okay, exactly right. This beast and false prophet. And who do we identify the beast and false prophet with? So the beast is one thing, false prophet's another. False yeah, Rome, Imperial Rome, government of Rome, probably the emperor of Rome. So that ruling power and then the religious cult that enforced emperor worship. Those two things are gone. Those two things are defeated. And so you understand naturally it then goes into this idea. Well, now Satan is bound up. He doesn't have those at his disposal to use against Christians. So he's limited in that power, that ability to work among men and to try to coerce, force, intimidate, punish them into doing the bit, his bidding, if you will. But he's not totally disabled. How do we know that? When you have the defeat of the beast, you have the defeat of Rome, you have the defeat of the imperial cult of Rome. Did Satan quit working? Stopped, you know, and we we understand that even together with the uh, apostate beliefs that are being promoted and, and all the other deception which he is the father of continuing. Right, right. 
What it's giving us a picture of, Paul? Well, we don't want to go too far because we know Christ has all authority. Yes. We still have that. And we also still have free will. We do have free will. Those two things still apply. Yes. Yes. So it's not telling us that Satan is unable to do anything. It's just saying he's limited. Think of it this way. Th think of a, uh, like a dog on a chain. Right? A dog on a chain, let's just say, I don't know, what's the most evil dog? Is it going to be Pitbull? No, it's probably a Pitbull lover. Like, you can't say that. Let's just say Pitbull because they've got a reputation, right? You put it on a 30-foot chain. And within that 30-foot radius of that chain, he can do his business. He can get after you. You step inside that radius, and you're, he's on it. But you're outside of that, he can't touch you. So think of that as the binding of Satan. Not that he's bound, that he can't move or do anything. Think of him just being simply fettered, that he has a sphere in which he can work, but he can't, he can't do anything outside that sphere. He's lost that ability with the beast and the false prophet being done away with. Mike. All right. Any, any thoughts, any questions? Does that make sense? Steve, would this also be kind of an example when we look at what was happening with the power of Satan before Christ came and the possessions and, and those that were working demonic things, you know, that... We know that his head was bruised. His ability to do those things also ceased. So there was a limitation, but it didn't stop him in totality, did it? Okay, no. Yeah, exactly right. Um, just a quick side note here to expand on what Ron's talking about is there, there are people today who believe in demon possession. And whenever I've been asked about that, no, I don't believe in it at all. Well, why don't you believe in it? Well, because miracles don't occur today. That's why. Not that... Here, God always gives mankind whatever power is needed to overcome Satan. And in the first century, we read about demonic possessions. Well, what was right there along with demonic possessions? The power, the ability of God's people to cast them out. And if there's no ability to cast them out, which the Bible clearly portrays, it says, you know, those powers will cease, there's no demonic possession today. So don't let anybody get you worried or upset or anxious or be fooled about some silly TV program about all this paranormal demonic possession stuff. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. But he's limited in his power. He's been limited since the first century. Seems also that some of the things that we can also do in is this because whenever, whenever we read in the New Testament, specifically where Paul says that you know death is swallowed up in victory. And where is your sting, death? Where is it? Because that no longer has a sting <coughs> that it did because Christ came into the into the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going there or not, so I don't really want to. Yeah, no, that that's fine. Yeah. So, but what we do see Satan still has the ability to get into sin so that death still has its sin. It's, but now it's on us. Right. Now it's on us, but we have the ability, of, from Paul's perspective, because of the resurrection of Christ and because we look forward to that resurrection, you know, that's death, that sting's been taken away. Um, something here I want us to think about is it talks about this uh, reigning with Christ for a thousand years. Remember earlier in Revelation chapter 11 when you had the two witnesses come out, they, they're, they're preaching that gospel, preaching God's word into the world, and the world ended up killing them, and it said left their bodies in the street for three and a half days, but then they were caught up to God. Think about the three and a half days compared to the thousand years. And it's helping us just put in this perspective as he's trying to through the entire book of yes, there is this persecution. Yes, there's this time of suffering, but it is short-lived. It's short-lived. It's, 
It may not seem like it when you're going through it, but it's short, and the, what Christ has done, that is long-term. He is triumphant and fully triumphant, if you will. All right, so Christ and the faithful, verses 4 to 6, are victorious. Um, who are these souls here? How does it describe them? Verse 4. Okay. One, this is souls. This is a picture of heaven, not earth. And they're beheaded. They're martyrs. They've given their life for Christ. Um, they've been tormented uh, as well. And they reign with Christ. We know that from the time that he ascended into heaven, right, where it talks about uh, in Acts chapter 1, he ascends into heaven. In Acts chapter 2, Peter declares he is Lord and Christ. That he talks about him sitting on the throne of David. So we want to understand that Christ has been reigning on his throne from then forward. And by the time the book of Revelation is written, he's been reigning. And he's just simply describing here that these martyrs share in that reign. They are ones who have helped to establish and to advance the cause of Christ. And so they are with Him. They're having fellowship with Him in this rule or in this reign, if you will. Um, the emphasis here is on their triumph. Uh, any other thoughts there? through verse 4 or 5. I've got a few more things. Alright, so it talks about that these individuals that, let me see, in verse 4, they had not worshipped the beast, they had not received the mark on their foreheads or their hands, they lived and reigned for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now we read that and sometimes we, we may get hung up a little on that. Because when we think of resurrection, what do we normally think of? What normally just pops straight to our mind? The what? The final resurrection. We think of bodily resurrection. Right? I submit to you here what this is talking about is a spiritual resurrection of the church. The cause of Christ. Because it looked like when the beast and the false prophet were active and strong and coming against the people of God, it looked like the cause was doomed, that it would soon die. But now with them being done away with and with Satan being bound, that cause revives. And if you go back in history and you look at what happened from the time, this time, Domitian, all the way up through Constantine, it looked like in that period, the very dark days of Christianity looked like it wouldn't survive. It was finished. But then Constantine accepts Christianity and things change. And you end up getting worldwide Christianity, if you will. You end up getting, you know, what comes out of Rome, Constantinople, uh, Jerusalem, Alexandria, become very powerful centers for Christianity. It, very long ago. But be that as it may, this is a resurrection of the cause. Are there any other things you can remember in the Bible where it talks about a type of resurrection when there wasn't a bodily resurrection? In Romans chapter 6, when we are buried in the waters of baptism, okay. we rise and walk in the newness of life. And also in chapter 8, he says, for children and heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, that we deeply suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Speaking of the resurrection of life. Yeah, we've been raised up together with Him, Ephesians chapter 2, to, or, uh, yeah, 2, talks about raised up together with Him. Um, remember, Ezekiel talked about the valley of dry bones. And that's a picture of Israel and coming back to life. God giving life back to Israel. That's, it, it was dead, right? And brought it back. Um, what about Isaac and Abraham? 
the Hebrew writer says he received him from the dead. He was resurrected. In, in Abraham's mind, he was confident God that he received him back from the dead because in Abraham's mind, he was dead. When he went out to offer him, he was dead in Abraham's mind. But then he came back to life in that type of resurrection. So we want to understand it's not unusual to have this language that's not a literal bodily resurrection applying to other contexts or aspects. Rick? Just something you, you mentioned that just popped out at me is because you mentioned the fact that this is referring to the church here being resurrected. Um, verse 6 really brings that to life because blessed and holy is as part of the first resurrection. Mm -hmm. So it says the second death has no power. So those of us who are in the church and they shout to the priest, which we're supposed to say to priests. Uh, and we are reigning as priests in the kingdom. So mm -hmm. Royal priesthood. Exactly right. It is go ahead, Nancy. Well, I was just gonna say in Colossians three, he talks about that again. For you have died and your life is hidden in Christ. Well Christ resurrected, so that means we are resurrected in that spiritual burial mm -hmm. and resurrection. Right, right. The baptism has there, there are others who would make this specifically an application to baptism. Um, and either way, it's a scriptural concept of what is, what is unfolding or what he's describing here. But the overall point is that the cause of Christ is triumphant. Those who are dedicated to him are triumphant and they are ruling and reigning with him. They share in that reign with him. And so it says, blessed are those who are of the first resurrection. Uh, well, first of all, it says, the rest of the dead did not live again. And that's a reference to non-Christians. That, that's talking about their, their time of power and influence and ability to oppress the people of God. That's been put down. And they will not, it says, do not live again until the thousand years were finished. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit because that's another one that kind of kind of bends my mind a little bit um, to think about what that could be or what it is. But question number one, I had asked, what is the second death and then what is the first? And this goes from here really a little bit further in the book, but... Okay. Yeah, second death is hell being cast into hell. And the first death then... Yeah, it is a physical death. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else through verse 6? Steve, that point that you were just making over in 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 and 12, he says, This is a faithful saying, For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Just as you pointed out here. Yeah. The, these are the faithful to God that are ruling and reigning with Him. Uh, and that's, as Rick said, that's why we are called a royal priesthood. Because we are royalty in the kingdom of God, ruling and reigning with Him. All right, uh, let's read verses 7 through 10, Revelation 27 through 10. Who will grab that for us? Mike. When a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. It will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. God and make God to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are also. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay. The thousand years have expired. Satan will be released from his prison. Go out and deceive the nations. Gog and Magog. Gather them together to battle. Okay. So you read that. Beast and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire in chapter 19. 
In 20, it opens up with, well, this angel comes down and binds up Satan for a thousand years. But at the end of that thousand years, he's let loose. Okay, so what exactly is that pointing to? Um, it doesn't describe it, first of all. It doesn't tell us specifically how that's going to happen. But it mentions this Gog and Magog. Does anybody remember what that's about or does, do you have an idea of what it's referring to with Gog and Magog? If you go back into the book of Ezekiel 38 and 39, again, this is one of those places where it takes an Old Testament reference and gives it a New Testament meaning. Right? We don't want to get into this position of mixing these things up as Mike was talking about a while ago, going back and making Ezekiel mean the exact same thing as what is being referenced here in Revelation 20. All it's simply pointing to is Gog and Magog are the enemies of God. They're representative of the enemies of God and of God's people. And it's just saying he's going to go get these enemies, he's going to gather them up, and he's going to kind of try this one last time to go and to defeat the people of God. It says from the four corners of the earth they're going to be gathered from everywhere. So, I don't know if this has just a general reference to, okay, Rome and its persecution and that incredible power that it had against saints in the early centuries of Christianity if it's saying that that's not the last enemy that God's people will face, that there will be more enemies in the future, they'll be powerful, but not like what they were before, that Satan will recruit others to get involved in his schemes, and he'll seek to destroy the people of God. If there's going to become a time where there's a powerful government and a powerful religious movement that is against God's people, a very concerted attack. I don't know if that's it. You know, is it something like uh, Islam? Is it denominationalism that has corrupted the minds of men? One of the most brilliant things Satan ever came up with was denominationalism. Here's kind of the truth. That is so, so bad. Um, humanist governments... Uh, immoral things in society. You know, all these things I think we can see work together with Satan that are working together against the people of God from all kinds of angles. And I look at this and I'm like, yeah, he's got Gog and Magog kind of gathered up. Um, Nancy. Well, to me it was, it, it, it was this, what you're talking about, the spiritual battle that's going on, but it's also the moral battle. That's a, a little bit Yes, morality is involved in spirituality, but but it's it's another front. The moral front is one side of the attack, and the spiritual is the confusion about what God has said. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It seemed to me it was it hits it both ways. Even if you don't believe in God, you can have a, a moral standard, but that is even another attack. Right, right. It's it's all. Uh, together, if you will, they're working together in collusion against the people of God. And, it, and what I would take this of Satan being loose is simply this idea of he's going to be able to recruit other powerful enemies of God's people and go against them. That's what he will be doing. But there is this certain and final outcome that quickly follows as he's recording it here. Mike? Yeah, you don't want to get too much into the Olympics, look at you know, right. what our premillennial friends do now. Um, you know, the, whenever we start to read again in Paul's writing, in Paul's writing it's about like death being the last enemy. You know, that's kind of what we're looking at here. We're kind of getting that glimpse, I guess. Yeah. You know, it all kind of Down at the end of the chapter, for sure. Yeah, exactly. And it, yeah, what what he's doing in this chapter is. He's just talked about, you know, beasts of false prophet are done. Now understand what that means is Satan is going to be bound. He's going to be limited. 
Doesn't mean he stopped working because he's definitely still working. He's still gathering these other powerful enemies. That's going to happen. But when you get right down to it, he's finished. Because verse 10, the devil who deceived him cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. And that's where he will be forever and ever. Um, so question three I'd ask, what happens to God's enemies? They're defeated, of course. And what lesson can we take from this? Any lesson? How about what encouragement can we take from this? Maybe I should have asked that. Well, that God will always win. He will always win. And those that are with Him will always prevail mm -hmm. into eternity. Right. Um, anybody ever wonder what's going to happen to the church in the next generation? I know I've wondered that. Well, what's what's going to happen? I mean, you just see how how many people are being pulled away into the world. How few people are interested in the gospel these days. It's just how is this going to last? Well, we're not the first ones to face that situation. <laughs> okay. It's something over history has shown that it builds up and it shrinks down. Builds up and shrinks down kind of as time goes. And situations in the world kind of affect how it happens. And okay. Alright. In the 1800s into the 1900s, Christianity, like the religion of Christ, what you can read about in the New Testament, it exploded in this country where people that the timing was right the culture was right and people just listened to that message they grabbed onto it they believed it and we are legacies we we've received that heritage if you will right now that kind of thing is taking place in the Philippines, in India, some places, Africa, South America, not here. You know, in Europe, in the 18, 1900s, people were disinterested in religion. They just... Now, you go back further, you go back into the Reformation movement, there is a huge upheaval, a huge churn, if you will, in that society over religious beliefs and practices. Right? And in the midst of that, you, we can read of glimpses of people who were seeing truth. They were seeing it. They may not have fully gotten there, but they were seeing it. But what we understand is that from the time the church was established to this day, it has always existed. It has always been there. We may not be able to read about it in history because the saints are from people that are considered nothing in the world. We're not the mighty. We're not the noble, if you will. As Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But the, the church has always been there. It has survived and gone forward. And here in the book of Revelation, he's saying the church is not only going to survive, but it's going to thrive. It's going to be victorious with Christ. Mike? Well, you know, just, just to your point, I mean, whenever uh, Jesus was talking to Peter, and he said, you know, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overthrow it. It will always be here. And whenever you look at what's, what's been the two consistent things, the church has always been here, and the Word has always been here as well. Mm -hmm. Never gone away. They go hand in hand. So as we, you know, doing what we do today, and that is we look into the Word to change our lives, and hopefully uh, others will see that and want to change their own lives, that's how it perpetuates itself. Maybe small times, but the Word will always be there to where there will be no one who said, I didn't know. Right, right, exactly right. Any other thoughts? When, the, when all of that, that was exploding and the church was really taking off, at the same time, it's interesting to me that Satan introduced transcendentalism. Mm -hmm. So that was to say, take the focus off of God, focus on yourself, focus on nature, focus on all that. So whenever God's word is, is really pushing forward, Satan comes up with some belief 
to draw people away from that. It's always happened, but I, I thought of that immediately when you were saying mm -hmm. how that just exploded. Yes, it's sort of transcend transcendentalism. Well, and really in the, the late 1800s, I know it existed before, but uh, Darwin evolution, sure. uh, there was the higher criticism that came out of Europe that affected people's religious views. Um, yeah, all these things, you're exactly right. Whenever the Lord's cause begins to flourish, Satan goes in overdrive to try to crush it and put it down. And that's, that's happening. I mean, okay, think about what's happened over this past year. I know personally, just reading about what's happened in the Philippines, you know, they're, they're very limited, very restricted. People who, uh, brethren who are able to go out and to preach far and wide, and, and I mean, just baptisms occurring that you and I are just like, that can't happen. Well, yeah, it does happen. Well, it did until they were all locked down and restricted in their movements. So Satan is working against the people of God to, to this day, but we have to have this confidence God is working too. And God will overcome that in some way. All right, let's read verses 11 through 15. 11 through 15, who will read that for us? <coughs> Go ahead. And I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. The death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found in the book of life, Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. All right. So this great judgment scene with the great white throne being obviously God's throne. And it just it's interesting, you know, it describes that throne and him who sat on it from whose face the heaven and earth fled. Just want to make a quick point there that when it talks about this great white throne and I saw him who sat on it, Throughout the rest of the entire book, whenever it references God the Father, there's no description. There's no, he, he just says, I heard. Hey, this really is the picture of Christ sitting on that throne of judgment. The Bible repeatedly refers to the idea that we're going to be judged by Christ. Yes, we're judged by God. We understand that. But really, the one who is executing that judgment is going to be Christ. So this is the picture of him there being on the throne, judging mankind. And there was found, it says that earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Why would that be? What is that referring to? The, the, the physical destruction of the world that Peter talks about. It's all burned up. Yeah, it's all burned up. It's gone. It's poof, nothing doesn't exist any longer. That's the idea of the heaven and the earth fleeing from him. It's, it's found. No, there's no place found for them. And then it talks about this dead, small, and great who are before the Lord. So it doesn't matter. You know, the Bible's replete with those references about everyone is going to stand before the judgment of God. And then it talks about books were open. And another book is open, which is the book of life. So there's the books and then the book. Question number four I'd ask, what are the books? Plural. Anybody got anything? Ron. Well, we have the book of life that's given to us. We also have the word of God, you know, which is um, for us what God has recorded and stating as we're reading now is judgment that will be before us. So our desire is if we understand this book and live it, then our name will appear in the book of life. Okay. Paul? It appears that those in the book of life live and those other books were not the books of life. 
Okay. What does the Bible say we're going to be judged by? Jesus said that his words were going to judge us. Okay, his words. You you just said something, Paul. What did you say? The word. By the word. Okay, you said what's written in the book. What? Is it, oh, what hold, I'm, I'm just trying to make a quick point. How many books are here? 66. There's 66 books. But what does it come down to? Okay, there's one, yes. 27 for us in the new. There's 39 in the old. Okay, let me ask you this. Are we going to be judged by what's written in Leviticus? Our deeds. Will David be judged by what's written in Leviticus? King David? Absolutely. He lived under the law. We have to remember there's three epics in biblical history. There's patriarchal age from Adam down to Moses. And there is a law of God under which men lived at that time. Then from Moses down to Christ, there's the law of Moses that applied to the Israelites. The Israelites are going to be judged by that law of Moses. That's the book they will stand in judgment before. You and I, living this side of Christ, we're judged by the book of the New Covenant. So there's the books that are opened up and then the book of life that is opened up. Who is it that's written in that book of life? The faithful written in that book of life. And so we're going to be judged before God depending on what time period we lived on this earth. What law of God was in effect at the time. We are going to be judged by the gospel, Mike. You're saying Noah will have a book opened up to him and then Moses and thereafter will have a book opened up to him and then after the resurrection, there's a book there also. Yes. But also, the names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That means the blood that went both, direct, every, both directions. Exactly. The Lamb's book of life is what our name has to be written. Yeah, the laws are three separate. Mm -hmm. But the Lamb's, everyone who lived according to those laws will be in the Lamb's book because the blood went both ways. Exactly. Exactly right. All right. Um, got like two minutes here so let's jump forward just a little bit uh, it talks about that the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to their works um, so we're each judged according to our works we're judged individually we're not judged by why well, intended to do something good right Matthew chapter 7 talks about People who intended to do something good, they were, they thought even that they were doing something good for the Lord, but in the end he says, I never knew you. So it's, we're not judged by our intent, though we need to have the right intent. We're judged by what we do. Did we do or did we not do the commandments of God? Did we follow Him? Were we faithful to Him or were we not faithful to Him? And so then this idea of the dead giving up or the sea giving up the dead. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. So Hades being the realm of departed spirits, giving up the dead, and then they're all, of course, judged. And death and Hades cast in the lake of fire. And I ask question six, what two things last until judgment? Death and Hades. What impact does it have on the 80-70 doctrine? Does anybody, have you all studied the 80-70 doctrine before? Probably not in depth, but I've read Okay. Yeah, I think John did whenever um, he was. Uh, okay, Chris. Oh, okay, okay. Basically, the 8070 doctrine says that in 8070, the resurrection happened, that everything um, came to an end, that it was the end of time. Uh, there is no Hades. Um, and, and it's pretty involved. In fact, maybe we'll, we'll study that here one day but anyways here it says that death and Hades are going to last until the Lord returns to the final judgment okay these things are going to last 
until then, and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. As um, Mike had referenced a while ago, you know, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the last enemy put under his feet is death. And this is a reference to that here. All right. Any other thoughts? Thank you all very much. Lord willing, chapter 21 next week.